one of the things that I'm going to be talking about today is learning and growing. And uh, are we on air, Ariana? Yeah. Okay. One of the things that uh, I want to make really clear is that uh, churches do, in fact, die. 1,600 pastors a month are leaving the ministry. I personally do not believe that God ever establishes a work for it to close. Who's with me? If God sets a vision for a church, that church is to go on. It has a purpose. God has a mandate for that church to fulfill. Amen? Amen. Amen. And so we're going to be talking about that today. We're going to talk about why churches die. And do you know why we're going to do that? Anybody have any ideas? Information. Because I don't want our church to die. Yeah. You'll find I'm a pretty straight up guy. Right? I was reading a book um, this week. Eric, can you check that thing? Monitor it, please. It's uh, a book by uh, Tom Rainer. I love this. I bought it. Amazing, uh, amazing little treatise. He was a, a consultant and a minister for a while. And what he did was he uh, went around and took a look at 14 of the churches that he was working with and the main reasons why they closed their doors. And we're going to be looking at that today. It's, it kind of inspired me as I was reading it. I took my daughter out for a field trip. Who's ever been up to uh, Co Coconut Creek? That's a good little park, eh? Well, they had some salmon spotting. And she came back and she was so excited. Fish, fish. <laughs> she loved it. It was awesome. She just loved it. Because you've seen that cycle of God's creation and it was beautiful. But this morning, I want to start us off with some prayer. So before we get going, does anyone have any prayer requests? Okay. Ralph and Julie, anybody else? The safety when we head down the coast again next week? Absolutely. Okay. Heavenly Father, we pray for journey mercies. We pray for Steve and for Teresa. We pray that your host will go with them and keep them in safeguard as they journey. Mighty God, they're going through such a wonderful time right now with the addition of this wonderful, wonderful grandchild. And we just ask, Lord, that you'll just continue to enrich their lives and bless them. But most of all, Lord, we love seeing them. We love their fellowship. So please keep them in safeguard as they travel. Jesus, I pray for my wife this morning. I pray, mighty God, that you will just continue to heal her, this, this hernia operation, God. Um, it is evident how much she does in our lives when she can't do it. Please, God. <laughs> So, I'm just asking you, Jesus, that you speed her healing and that you take her pain away and that you help her, God, to recover in your mighty name. I pray for my Uncle Randy, who's got a lesion on his chest they suspect is cancerous. He dropped to 98 pounds, and Lord, we're just really concerned about him. Uh, my mom has flub and food into him every day. The doctors are monitoring him. So, God, we're believing for good things. You are the great physician. It is by your stripes we are healed. Lord, for our brother Ralph. We just pray, God, right now, in your mighty name, Jesus, God, that you will heal this, that you will bring back regular breathing rhythms, that you will bring back the oxygen that he needs, that you will help him, God, with whatever he needs in his body, Lord, to be well and healthy and happy and live an abundant life in you. Lord, we pray for Lauren. Lord, we just ask that you'll continue to speed his healing, God. Jesus, sometimes these medical things come into our lives, Lord, and we just ask that you will just be there, God, that you, you, will, you have said that you will never leave us or forsake us. But Lord, we need to feel your presence. Lord, cause us to see your face in everything that we go through in this life. And Lord, for any unspoken requests this morning, things that people either feel that they're not comfortable to share or that they're too personal or whatever, Lord, you know what they are. And God, sometimes we know what they are. But Jesus, we just pray, Lord, that you will intercede and that you will touch each and every person in this place, that you will quicken their hearts and that you will bless them in the mighty name of Jesus. And we all came together and said, Amen. All right, so I said we were going to talk about a sermon, How Churches Die. Okay? All right, so, good morning. Today we're going to talk about...
about how churches die. First, let me state unequivocally that God does not establish his churches with the expectation that they will die. The church is not expected to be mortal, but eternal. You with me? Eternal. So then why do churches close down? Why do they die? Why do pastors leave the ministry in frustration? Why do people give up on fellowshipping in the church? These are all good questions. Let me start with a small story. There was once an older woman, and she was extremely sick. She needed a cure as there was a cancer growing within her. Her doctor, her family, and her friends all sought to get her to get treatment for her illness. Yet she refused to admit that she needed serious help. Her friendly nature and welcoming attitude had gradually disappeared as despondency and despair started to set in. Every uh, option, or I'm sorry, every month she was getting sicker and more bitter. She kept thinking that she didn't need to change her opinion on getting help. She was stubborn, and she refused to do what was required for her to become healthy once again. Her pastor prayed for her. He advised her to get the help she needed, yet she would not hear his message, and so she denied that she was dying. This is like serious, stage four kind of stuff, right? Her words took on the defiance and vehemence as she emphatically stated, I'm not dying. She absolutely refused to change, and so her suffering worsened, and eventually she died. She, of course, is church. Let that sink in for just a moment. Today, churches are dying because they're stubbornly refusing to change. I am the Lord, I change not. That's right, the Lord changes not. But our society changes, and more and more, our culture says the church is irrelevant. So how do we reach a culture that has been indoctrinated to move away from the things of God? How do we bring that light to the darkness? How do we stand up here in Selmo as a lighthouse on the hill? She lost her hope, her vision for the future. You know, Proverbs 29 and 18 says, Where there is no hope, the people perish. But he that keepeth the law, happy is he. Let me read this for you in the HCSB, as the intention of this passage is even more clear. Without revelation, the people run wild, but no one who listens to it, or sorry, but one who listens to instruction will be happy. Churches which are the people and not the building need to take hold of the vision of the church, embrace God's purpose for his church, and be willing to be obedient to the instruction of their overseers. Wow. Not something that's popular in this day and age, right? Okay, so, to the church in our story this morning, which is a true story being played out in thousands of churches across Canada, the U.S., and other places, they're living this scenario, or should I say gradually dying. First of all, let me ask a question before I even go on. Who is upset when they hear of churches closing down and God being removed in our community? I grieve that. I literally grieve that when I hear those stories. I was going to read that scripture. Okay, anyway, the church is our story this morning, which is a true story. It's played out in those thousands of churches across Canada, the U.S., not so much in other places. You know... It's interesting that when we do a, a revival meeting or a call or something like that here, we may get 50, 100 people show up. You know, I was looking at this revival meeting in, in Africa where they um, had a, a ministerial call where they wanted people to come and learn about Jesus. And so they rented a stadium with 50,000 seats. Why don't you think about this for a minute? 
They had to do the thing on the streets because almost half a million people showed up. Do you know why? Because they're not entitled, they're hungry for Jesus. They need something in their life. They've hit this place where they know that they need something. But in North America, our churches are barely getting, you know, 100, 200, 300 people. I'm delighted with this turnout, by the way, today. This is awesome. Thanks, guys, for coming. This is great. But my point is, is it's not about um, that. I, I would love to see 1,800 residents of Selmo area here. I would love to be so filled with capacity that we have to open the windows and preach to the grass outside. And you know why? Not to build Ray's kingdom, but to build God's kingdom. To help people that are struggling. To help people that are hurting. To help people that have no hope. But you know what? It's been so jaded with TVs and movies and things like that. I'm not picking on that. What I'm saying is, is that culturally, over the years, it's been indoctrinated to view the church in a certain way. There's this promulgation of an attitude, especially across America, that Christians are a bunch of uneducated rednecks, and nothing can be further from the truth. God wants us to use our brains. He wants us to think of things. He wants us to be in touch. He wants us to be active. He wants to build His kingdom here and work with us. Without revelation, the people run wild. The one who listens to instruction will be happy. Churches are not buildings. They're not infrastructure. The church is you and you and you and you and you and everybody here. We are the church. In today's socialistic, consumeristic society, the attitude that many people have towards serving God and attending His house is terrible. A church has a purpose, which we will look at shortly. But let me just say that the first symptom of a dying church is a lack of desire to show up for prayer meetings. We don't even have one right now. I tried to do pre-service prayer by myself. God bless the Hansons. Duke is another guy that we used to get together on Wednesdays. We used to pray for this community. We used to pray for individuals in the church. We used to just bring the house down. And you know why? Because I believe that a church survives with prayer. The first symptom of a dying church is a desire to show up for prayer meetings or even... Uh, pre-service prayer. Without this element, there's a lack of intimacy that creeps into the relationship between God's people and God. You know that I do marriage counseling and, and other forms of pastoral counseling. And not so much here. Not You guys aren't having problems right now, but I've done this when I was a uh, counseling pastor at Gateway. I had a lot of things happening there. But let me say this. One of the most significant things that happens in every single relationship that's breaking down every single one I learned to ask the question what's your prayer life like because without fail if there was no prayer life the intimacy was suffering in the relationship you need to pray with your spouse. You need to get together and say, Lord, I'm going to pray for Julie tonight. You know, praise God. She's a wonderful woman and, and pray for her and have her pray for you and lift each other up and be there. And you know what? You will find intimacy increases. Do you know why? Because we serve a God of love. How would your relationships continue if you don't ever talk to your spouse? Some just carry on. But they gradually lose intimacy. 
and they die. You need to talk to the Lord. More importantly, when you're talking to the Lord, you need to have moments where you just stop and listen. What's God saying to you? You need to learn to hear His voice. If you need to know how to do that, I've got a great sermon online called Hear You. It talks about hearing the words of God, how to hear the Lord in your heart. But without prayer, there's a lack of intimacy. Change doesn't happen fast in a church. It's slow and deadly. It's really slow. Consider a human being who's living comfortably in the world. If they experience a heat wave, heat wave like we had this last year, who, who felt it was hot? Linton was hot. That was a tragedy, by the way. But, you know, 49 degrees centigrade? Wow. You know? Many people will try to get out of the heat. They may buy an air conditioner, seek some cool water in the lake, some other mechanism of cooling. It only makes sense, right? It's hot. I want to cool down. You're too hot, so you take some action to remedy the situation. Do you know there's a thing called the wet bulb temperature? This is a cool thing. Scientists use it all the time. There's two thermometers, and one they wrap up in a wet, wet cloth. Okay? The reason they do that is to determine the relative humidity of the atmosphere, because when one is wet versus dry, right, the temperature variation is different. Wow, that's interesting. That's why they put a humidity in your weather forecasts. I'm going to explain this in a minute, but let me give you a brief summary. If the relative humidity gets to a certain point, <coughs> what happens is your body will no longer sweat. And so that temperature has no way to cool or dissipate, and so it turns inside and destroys your organs, and you die. Wow, fascinating, right? Well, it's a science lesson. Just bear with me. We'll get through the academic bit in a minute. Okay? But why should you care? Well, if a thermometer is wrapped in water moistened cloth, it will behave differently. And drier, less humid the air is. The faster the water will evaporate. The faster the water evaporates, the lower the thermometer's temperature will be relative to the temperature. Okay? Water can only evaporate if the air around it can absorb more water. There is a purpose for this science lesson this morning, so please stay with me. It can only absorb so much. Okay? The faster the water evaporates, the lower the thermometer's temperature will be relative to that air temperature. Now, this is measured to compare how much water is in the air to the maximum which could be in the air. That's called relative humidity. 0% means the air is completely dry, and 100% means the air contains all the water it can hold in the present circumstances. It cannot absorb any more water from any other source. This is part of the cause and apparent temperature in humans. The drier the air, the more moisture it can hold beyond what it already has, the easier it is for extra water to evaporate. Please stay awake, I'm just about done. The result is that the sweat evaporates more quickly in drier air, cooling down the skin faster. The relative humidity is 100%, no water can evaporate, and cooling by sweating or evaporation is no longer possible. You cannot sweat, your body does not dissipate heat, the heat turns inward, causing death. When your internal temperature reaches 104 degrees Fahrenheit, your organs will start to shut down. Okay? When the relative humidity is 100%, a wet bulb thermometer can also no longer be cooled by evaporation, so it will read the same as the unwrapped thermometer. Even heat-adapted people cannot carry out normal outdoor activities past the wet bulb temperature of 32 degrees centigrade or 90 degrees Fahrenheit. That's equivalent to a heat index of 55 degrees centigrade or 130 degrees Fahrenheit. The theoretical limit for human survival for more than a few hours in the shade 
even with unlimited water, is 35 degrees centigrade, theoretically equivalent to a heat index of 70 degrees or 160 degrees Fahrenheit. The index, heat index does not go that high. So, here's the question. If it's 150 degrees already and the humidity is starting to decrease and you can no longer do these things and you're actually literally dying, then the human race, <coughs> just a cough, don't panic, then the human race is literally going to boil to death if we don't do something about it. Now, I want to tell you something. I was a, a, a business analyst, business architect for many years, and one of the things we used to talk about was this frog thing, okay? So you might be thinking at this point, okay, Pastor, so why the science lesson? Well, there's this old legend that if you put a frog into boiling water, it'll immediately jump out, but put him in the pot slowly and raise the temperature and he will stay and die. Okay? It's used in a lot of corporate uh, lessons and stuff like that to say that you have to pay attention to what's happening around you so that it doesn't creep up on you and take you out. The actual fact is that doesn't happen. Frogs do not like hot water. They jump out of the pot. No animals were harmed in this sermon. Okay? How many people here this morning have ever been to a town, village, or city when they were younger? Okay? But then, many years later, returned to that same place and hardly recognized it. Yeah. Like, I came up from Vancouver, North Van, about, uh, what, 12 years ago? And... When I went down there recently, I could not believe the changes between Chilliwack and Surrey, the way the highways restructured in there. It was uh, unbelievable. You see, but you ask a local person and they'll say that it's been that way for a long time. You ever notice that phenomenon? Oh, it's, it's been like this almost forever. It's an interesting phenomenon. Right? It's interesting. The local may not notice the difference immediately because it's so gradual. It's like watching the hour hand on a clock. It's moving, but it's so slow and imperceptible that while you're doing it, you're not noticing the change. That's what I'm talking about. I just want to make sure everybody's on the same page here. Okay? You're not noticing the pay to change. This is my long-winded way of saying that in churches, we have very, very slowly and almost insidiously gotten worse over time. The focus for many churches has gone from community focus to inward focus. Because of this, I have a couple of prayers that I invite you to say in your heart or to take off of this when I publish it later or whatever. But this is what came to my heart was, Dear Lord Jesus, please open my eyes to see that I might see your church as you do. Holy Spirit, open my eyes to recognize where that change needs to take place, even if it's uncomfortable for me personally. And God, use me as an agent of that change, fully invested in serving you and working to build your kingdom. All that I am is yours. All that I have is yours. Use me, O oh God, for your glorious purposes. You see, I think we need to turn our focus back to God. Back to God. So we need to open our eyes and see the changes that are happening. When I was a young man, I can remember my mother dressing me up in my Sunday best. Anybody else remember those days? We put on our little suits and our little ties. Or we wear, no, I know, I'm sorry, but most of the people here, not the younger gen, next gen's are bear with me, but 
you know, we used to put on our best shoes and we used to go there and the pastor would have this lovely ornate pulpit. He'd stand up, maybe he'd put on vestments, you know, um, I don't know, he'd pick out a piece of paper and put it in his collar or, or whatever it might have been. And he would stand up there and he would give the word of God and people would sit there with rapt attention. Or at least they would think sitting there with rapt attention. There was a respect for the pulpit. There was a respect for the things of God. There was a desire for ministry. There was a, 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 a cry. And it wasn't perfect, but it was a time. Who, who remembers what I'm talking about? Right? Where there was that thrust for God. There was an excitement in the time. And the church would get together for potlucks. And they go into the community and they have church picnics. Who ever went to a church picnic where they had like races and games and stuff? Awesome times. What have we lost? See, the hour hand is very slowly ticking along. And very slowly, we are losing things. I remember 30 years ago, I would never be caught dead standing up here with an open collared shirt and my jeans on. My mama would have taken me out by the woodshed. You understand what I'm talking about? Those were different times. And I'm not saying that everything about now is bad. I'm just saying we've lost some things. <laughs> things that I think we need to reclaim. No, I don't think we all have to get dressed up in suits. That's all superficial. God looks at the heart. What I think, though, is that there are things in our hearts and with our relationship to, with Christ that we need to recapture. We need to go back to our first love. We need to recapture that excitement. We need to recapture that fellowship. We need to recapture those prayer meetings. Who went to church where they used to have meetings on Sunday morning and Sunday night? Good. Who went to pre-service prayer in the morning before the service started? Who went to church on Wednesday nights? Who had youth group on Fridays? Who had a Bible study, which thank you, Landon, for starting one up again. You, know, you understand what I'm saying? There's something, and slowly, ever so gradually and slowly, things have fallen off the radar. This is not a new thing. I'm not blunt blaming Generation X, Generation Cs. I'm not even blaming the baby boomers. Do you know that the slow erosion of our churches, think, think about this, as a species, we've simply learned, not learned rather, from the mistakes of our past. I want you to consider with me the narrative of Haggai. You know the book in the Bible, Haggai, prophet, right? Okay. The year is 530 BC. That's a while back, isn't it? 530 BC. They were a ragtag collection of Jewish people that had just returned to Jerusalem. They'd been in exile for a long time, and when they got back, they found their town literally in ruins. It had been devastated. Okay? Now, as you might expect, their first order of business was to rebuild the church, the temple. Okay? And so they set forth and they laid the foundation. So when you think about that, everything's wiped out, church is important, so they start digging in the ground, they put in the forms, they lay down the concrete. They got the foundation for this house of the Lord put into place. That's good, right? All right. But soon, they were more concerned with their own comfort and so they began working on their own homes and accommodations to the exclusion of all else. They found their comfort and for more than 10 years, no one did any further work on the house of God. Oh, wow. So we're gonna go, we're gonna build all this foundation, we're gonna do all this stuff, we're gonna be excited about it, but then we're gonna say, hey, you know what? I'm tired of living in that tent, or I'm tired of living in that, uh, that mobile home, so I'm just going to give up on it, and uh, I'm going to start building my own house. So they went and they built their houses, their panel homes, and they made them beautiful. For more than 10 years. I want you to picture in your mind 
these lovely homes in this lovely little community. And I want you to picture these homes are neat and manicured, a point of pride. And yet walking down the road, you see the foundation of the house of God that's weathered with foliage beginning to overtake the work. Can you see that unfinished work in your head this morning? Can you see the neglected house of the Lord? So, what happens? Well, God asks a question. How many knows that God asks questions? I love the questions like, where are you at, Adam? God knows where Adam's at. He's asking a question because he wants him to come out with it. You know, oh Lord, I said, you know. But no, what does he do? He throws his wife under the bus. But God asks a question. This is what God says, right? He wants to know why they didn't notice the decline and why they have stopped building the temple. I don't know about you. I want God to be my friend. And I don't want him to say to me, Ray, <clears throat> you have a lovely house, you know, 20 guitars, if you've ever seen one. I mean, you've got all this stuff. You've got all these beautiful things. You've got a lovely family. I've blessed you for years. Why did you neglect my house? I want to hear that. Who here wants to hear that? Show hands. No. Nobody wants to face God and have that said. You know, so here's Haggai, chapter 1, verses 2 to 4. This is what the Lord Almighty says. These people say, the time has come to rebuild the Lord's house. Then the word of the Lord came through the prophet Haggai. It's time for you yourselves to be living in your paneled houses while this house remains a ruin. One more time. Is it time for you yourselves to be living in your paneled house while this house remains a ruin? Wow. Today in 2021, God is asking a question. He wants to know why his people aren't noticing the decline and why they've stopped building his kingdom. Now, I'm not about ornate pulpits. I'm not about fancy dress clothes. I'm not about any of that stuff. I'm not about kingdom building. But I'll tell you what I am about, seeing God's will and purpose fulfilled in Selma and seeing lives reached and having enough resources within the church to deal with those needs. I want to see us doing more things like we did a couple of years ago. Having music in the park, reaching the community. Do you know that day of music in the park? We, we raised a couple hundred bucks at a six foot high mound of food for the food bank. That came out of Selmo. Do you know, it doesn't take a lot to make a huge difference in your community. It only takes the desire to do it. That's what I'm talking about. I want to seize that day. I want to uh, carpe diem, right? Seize the day. God's church today enjoys much grace. And I believe that God's perception of, it, of this attitude towards his church is clear. Do you know in Haggai 1, chapter, or chapter 1, verse 9, it says this. You expected much, but behold, it amounted to little. And what you brought home, I blew away. Why? Declares the Lord of hosts, because my house still lies in ruins. Well, each of you is busy with his own house. I am the Lord, I change not. We have wonderful grace in Jesus. And I'll tell you though, I know that it grieves God's heart. And am, am I alone here? Like, maybe I'm silly, but I have a desire to bring a smile to God's face. 
I want to please God. I want God to say, well done, good and faithful servant. I know it was hard at times, but you persevered, you were faithful. You see, slow erosion of God's house was a problem even for them in 520 B.C. You'd think in 2,500 plus years we figured out, you know, that we still make the same mistakes over and over. We cannot neglect God's house. Who's ever heard of Laodicea? You know, Laodicea was rich, very rich uh, trade capital, right? And, and it was amazing. Like, people there were abundant. And you know, the church in Laodicea only stayed open because of a stipend from the Romans. They were complacent. They didn't care. Throughout the history of the church, you see these problems. Now, I'm not a Reformation kind of guy. I don't believe in the pre-Reformation where all the money came in and the priests took the money and they got themselves ornate robes and they did this and they did that and they built their own kingdoms. That's what the Reformation was all about. Why are we building these gold thrones when people on the streets are going hungry? Let me tell you, this next month I'm going to go to the board and I'm going to ask for something. I'm going to ask for three or four food cards of 25 bucks each and I'm going to have them put into a safe here in the office. And I'm going to have those because I don't care whether people abuse the system or not. There are people who are falling through the cracks and I have enough good judgment and I want my board to trust me enough that when those people are starving and hungry, there is a resource available to them. I have a pretty good idea what people are going to say. If not, I'll have to pay for it myself. And I have. Because I believe that God is going to bless stepping forward with our church when we step outwards into our community and turn ourselves from an inward focus to an outward focus. Wouldn't it be fantastic to have a church picnic where we have a bunch of events? You know, who, who knows Gerald Hutchman? Love that man. You know, he had a, a thing that he would do every year where he would run games in the park. I want to see that happen again. I want to see the kids able to get together and enjoy the day. I want to see people fellowshipping again. I want to see people bring a bucket of chicken and not be afraid to say to their neighbor, hey, come and join me for some chicken. I want people to try my potato masala. Who knows what that is? It's curried potato salad. And it's spectacular. I know it sounds gross, but it's not. Trust me, it is delicious. I want people to be able to have friendships to be able to trust each other, to have people to rely on, to be able to encourage each other, to lift each other up, not to backbite, to rip down and divide, but to encourage and lift up and, and to restore friendships and relationships. <coughs> there is absolutely no reason why God cannot make the center for change Selma. None. Some vision sound ambitious? Well, you know what? Let me say this. I'm not going to limit the size of my God. There's a vision for this place. The harvest is white. It's ripe for the picking. At first, people will be resistant. But you know what? I believe that so many people are hurting, so many people need something, that when the light starts to shine and they see 
the changes that are in the people's life because you are the message. Things will happen. I believe it. I believe it. Our church says we worship God. We worship God in all things in our life. We worship God with our time. We worship God with our praise. We worship God in our singing. We worship God in our finance. We worship God in everything. We are to worship our Lord. It says that if we don't worship God, even the rocks and stones will cry out. So let us get on the bandwagon and worship God. We love all people. If somebody comes in at the back of the church and they're smelling the booze, if somebody's got a mini skirt that's a little bit too revealing, let's help them. Let's give them hope. But most of all, instead of condemnation, let's give them love. I don't care what their personal pronouns are. Well, actually I do. There's a, there's a plan in God's, in God's um, book, but you know what? I believe that it's our job to love everybody. Let the Holy Spirit do His job. Let's do ours. You know, the Scripture tells us that we're supposed to love people. In fact, it's... It's, it's the twelfth, sorry, the Ten Commandments are distilled down to two very simple things that Jesus said. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, and soul, and love your neighbor as yourself. That fulfills all the law and the prophets. We're not called to be condemnational or to be judgmental. We're called to show people the love of Christ so that the Holy Spirit will draw them in and Jesus can save their very souls. If the church gets love right, everything else will fall into place. We need to love our community. We need to love and embrace our community. I got another revelation for you. You don't have to agree with somebody's lifestyle or their life choices in order to love them. Ooh, pastor, that's dangerous territory. No, you don't love sin. You hate the sin. Love the person. Is a person their sin? No, that's Gnosticism, isn't it? You know, no. The person is not their sin. Their sin is the condition of where they're at in their life right now. Do you believe that if a person is in sin, God can heal and restore and bring that person to a place of fellowship with Him? Yes. I believe it. How does that occur? It occurs by sitting down and showing them the Word of God and by giving them real, true love. Here's another prayer this morning. Dear Lord, I want to be part of the solution. Your kingdom needs dedicated disciples who are willing to roll up their sleeves to make a difference. Open my eyes to your vision here in the church and cause me to see things, not from an earthly perspective, but as you see them. Please, God, grant me the strength and the courage to carry out your will and to show your love to your people. So moving on, what's another problem that causes church to die? Well, quite simply, the past is where we live in the church. Everything is laurel leaves. What did we do before? How great we did. Look at all we accomplished over the years. Now, don't get me wrong. It is great to celebrate those things, to revel in it, to enjoy it. God sat back and rested when he did the work. But you know what? For a day. I want you to think about this. 
Lots of greatness has been done through this church and others. But the work is not finished. You're not done. God has called you for a purpose. That purpose is not complete. You have worth and value and purpose in the kingdom of God. How many people know there's no spare parts in the body of Christ? If you're not doing what you're called to do, what's the body missing? The past was great. But let's make today, tomorrow's past greatness. Seize the day. Who's ever heard of Harry Truman? Now I'm talking about Harry Randall Truman here, not the U.S. president. No. Oh, oh, okay. Oh, no, okay. All right. So I'm going to tell you who he is. He was a landover, landowner who lived at the base of Mount St. Helens at the south end of Spirit Lake in Washington. Okay? For those of us old enough to remember, Mount St. Helens was showing signs that she was going to blow her top in 1980. Who remembers those events? It was big, wasn't it? Um, the expert said there was a 100% chance that the volcano was going to erupt. There was no possibility of it not erupting. Because of the, his location, this fellow, Harry Truman, <clears throat> would be right in the path of where they expected the lava to flow. Right in the path. If he stayed, he would certainly die. His friends and his family pled with him to leave. They told him staying was suicide. On May 18, 1980, Mount St. Helens erupted and Harry Truman died. Why did Harry Truman die? It was because he couldn't let go of his past. He couldn't step outside of his comfort zone and embrace the future, even if it meant his death. So what do dying churches hold on to? There are several things. Styles of worship. You know why we do hymns and we do the modern stuff? As long as it's scriptural and reverential. Do you know why we do the whole spectrum? So that we don't get adapted to worshiping the form of worship instead of the person that the worship is for. I won't let go of a style of worship. I worship the form of worship. The building and its historical memories. Let's say that God decided to build his house and 300 people flooded into crossroads next Sunday. <clears throat> we couldn't hold that capacity. Would we be willing to let go of this building and go to something bigger in order to facilitate those people? I'm not talking about an ego trip. I'm talking about servicing the needs of the people. Like I know, and I'm thinking of a couple of people this morning who've been here for a long time. You've got this church, and it's got memories. And I'll tell you, when people walk this church, they're going to see their little kids in their mind, and they're going to see them at each stage of their development into adulthood here. That's hard to let go of. Who knows that would be hard to let go of? It's like selling a family home that you've been in for a long, long time. By the way, I'm not planning on selling the church or anything. <laughs> Just want to make it clear. But do you get what I'm saying at? I'm saying that we have to be able to embrace change if it becomes necessary for the good of the people. They compared the legacy of historical pastors instead of bracing the one they have. How many churches do that? 
You know, we have a pastor's council, and I praise the Lord for that every week. But I'll tell you, some churches have boards, and they literally crucify their pastors. There becomes a thing called Jezebelic control, and there's all kinds of issues and such, and politics and all kinds of stuff that happen in churches that is ungodly. God establishes his churches to meet the needs of the unsaved. Who did Jesus come to save? They compared and they contrasted. You know, I heard this story about a pastor. He came into a church and the piano was on the right side of the platform and he moved it onto the left side of the platform so they fired him. I know of a story locally where a pastor was fired for wearing knee-length shorts when mowing the lawn. This is the kind of garbage that goes on. But you know what? Another pastor came into that same church that fired that pastor and every Sunday he moved the piano over one inch. Five years later, the piano's on the other side of the platform and he still has his job. Mm -hmm. Here's the bottom line though. There's one common thread that every single dying church has in common. One red flag indicator that invariably leads to the death of the church. Do you know what that is? That's part of it, but that's not the one I'm going for. That is a factor. Over time, they developed an inward focus instead of an outward focus. It was all about meeting the needs of the people in the congregation instead of taking the church and meeting the needs of the community. Wow. Out of 200 churches, the autopsy of those churches, every single one had shifted to an inward focus and they lost their outward vision. That's right. Focus. So our second thing is we're supposed to love all people, but what is our third mission statement? What is it that we actually need to do? Crossroads says we embrace, and I chose that, embrace instead of support or something like that because it's a loving careful hug with permission i've walked up and i put my arms around this person and i'm loving them we embrace our community everything that comes across my board everything that we pay for everything that we do gets filtered through those three things does it worship god Yes, it's worshiping God. Awesome. Is it loving everybody? Or are we being exclusionary in some way? And three, are we embracing our community? <laughs> See, these churches wanted their needs met and only their needs met instead of the needs of others. Their highest priority was to do things the way they'd always done them and in the way that made them most comfortable. It was not only the past that they cherished, but their personal good old days. I'm not pointing at anybody. Nobody here has this problem. What I'm saying is this. This is what happened in the churches that died. We've had a lot of people in this church pass away in the last couple of years. If it wasn't for the faithfulness of the people that have been here for all those years, this church wouldn't have survived. They are pillars in the house of the Lord. They have supported it. They've kept these doors open. They've kept the heat on. They've kept the lights on. 
they supported their pastors, they've done all of these things, and they need to be honored for that. But let us not ever get to the point where we cannot let things go for the glory of God. You know, there's a people in Hebrews 11. They held nothing back. It says they held nothing back of this life, actually, is what the scripture says. Cause me not to worship those things, Lord. Actually, you know, I'm going to put a prayer here. Okay, let's do this. Okay. God, I know that condemnation is of the enemy, but so um, we're not going to be convicting, Lord. We don't believe in that. But Jesus, we believe in conviction. Lord, and Conviction is good. It comes from you. It brings about change. Nobody likes change, God, but sometimes change is needed. So God, cause me, O Lord, to have the courage of those Hebrews, or those people in Hebrews 11. Cause me to have their courage, O Lord. Cause me not to worship the things of my church, which are my personal preferences. Please show me, O Lord, where and how to let go so that I may be in your will and be a part of bringing more life to my community for the glory of your kingdom. Teach me, God, to hear your voice. Amen. I want to be real here for a moment. For the past 25 to 30 years, the church has held its own in a culture that is trying to make church relevant for today. Okay, church is struggling. Crossroads is no exception. I've been here for 10 years now, and I can honestly say that I have observed some things here that concern me. I figure after 10 years, I've earned the right to speak into it. You don't think so? Sorry. This is my feeling. This church has held its own in a culture that's trying to make our churches irrelevant for today. It's this time the church has not been react, reaching many new residents of the community. When was the last time new people were coming in? It has been resting on its laurels, but with a cost. There's a cost. There's no doubt it has done tremendous things. It has done great work. It has established people and taught so many people through the Sunday school and did wonderful things. And as the years have gone by, the children and the grandchildren have moved or shifted their focus and are no longer uh, attending. And I grieve with the parents. Or they've moved to another locale and gradually the church has thinned. I'm sure you all know people in the community that were once here or in a church, but no longer come. Some have left town completely. Others have stayed in the area, but instead of staying with the church, they failed to connect to its vision, and so have stopped being part of the church. Gradually and ever so slowly, people have come up with excuses and reasons not to bring new people into the church. And so the church has slowly begun its slow march towards death. The older faithful members of the church remain, but the younger members no longer come. No new young families are replacing them. What happens when the older members are passing away, or they're moving away, or they're retiring off, and they're no longer able to support and to help, and there's no new growth? It dissipates. And here's a reality of the church. You might not like me saying this because I'm not a business guy, I'm a spiritual guy, but I was a business guy. And where there is no resources, there's no ministry. I'm not talking about just finance. I'm talking about people willing to not say, oh, it's the pastor's job to go and do this. It's the pastor's job to bring people in. It's the pastor's job to minister and to witness. You know what? Yeah, it is. But it's yours too. My primary job is to equip you to do that work. We need to see people coming in. We need to see people getting filled with the Holy Spirit. We need to see people rejoicing and, and, and embracing God and, and, and embracing life and filling the abundance of their lives with that abundance that Christ has promised to give us. That's what we need to do. We need to shake ourselves. Carpe diem. Please bear with me, I'm almost finished.
of significant notice, notice that the attitude of the church has changed and that they expected the members of the community to come to them and to the church. Whenever an effort to reach out to the community is mentioned, all effort from the majority dies away. Let me make it really simple this morning. This is the takeaway. Others first equals life and it's God's way. Me first is death and it's the way of the world. Me first, others first. That's simple. Want to sum up this message? That was good, Pastor. I really like that. I wish you just said that and let us all go home. Right? You're so long-winded. You said all that to say others first, me first. Yes, I did. In Philippians 2, verses 1 to 4 in the Amplified Version, this is what it says. Therefore, if, anyone, if there is any encouragement and comfort in Christ, as there certainly is in abundance, if there is any consolation of love, if there is any fellowship that we share in the Spirit, if there is any great depth of affection and compassion, make my joy complete by being of the same mind and having the same love toward one another, knit together in the Spirit, intent on purpose, and living a life that reflects your faith and spreads the gospel, the good news regarding salvation through faith in Christ. Do nothing from selfishness or empty conceit, though uh, factional motives or strife, but with an attitude of humility, being neither arrogant nor self-righteous, regard others as more important than yourselves. Do not merely look for your own personal interests, but also for the interests of others. If you want a scripture to support others first, Philippians 2, 1 to 4. So friends, what's it going to be this morning? Will we watch our churches slip away into memory and irrelevancy? Or will we reaffirm our commitment to God, to Christ and His church, and once again embrace another's first mentality? See, the church is not a museum for saints. It's a hospital for sinners. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I come before you this morning. We thank you, Jesus. We thank you, God, for everything that you're doing here in Selma. We thank you for what you have done. We thank you for the glorious past of this church. Lord, we thank you for what you're doing today. We thank you, Lord, for what you will do in the future. And God, we thank you just because of who you are. We love you, Jesus. We embrace you, God. Cause our hearts, Lord, to turn to our communities, to have a heart of evangelism, to have a heart of making disciples for you. We're all called to your great commission, God. And so I ask today, Jesus, that where there be fear, it be broken down. Where there be anxiety, it be broken down. Where there be hurt or suffering, it be, it be healed and, and taken away, this, this suffering and that anxiety. I pray, Jesus, that your kingdom will be glorified. Lord, I pray that you will walk with each and every one of us. You said you'll never leave us or forsake us, God. So as we go about the mission of bringing the good news to the people of Samuel, to the Kootenays, to Canada, to the world, Lord, I just pray right now, God, that your blessing will suffuse every person here. That your kingdom, Lord, will, will establish a vision in each and every heart. That your laws will be written on the tablets of our heart. God, that your holy desire becomes our desire. And I pray, God, that you keep each person in safeguard as they leave this place. I pray today, Jesus, God, that, that this COVID just disappears that it's gone, that it's healed in the name of Jesus. God, we, we need to get back to our lives, the fellowship, the contact. So Jesus, I humble myself. I say, Jesus, please heal our nation. Heal our land, oh God. Heal the world. Thank you for it, God. And I thank you, Lord, for just, just because you're there and you bring me hope. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. For those of you who are joining us online, please make sure you hit the share button. It's a great way to testify. Okay, uh, please subscribe because when you do, it sends out notifications when new content is available. Look forward to seeing you all here again real soon. And thank you, everybody. I appreciate you coming this morning. Go with Jesus. You are dismissed.